Hi, I'm Doug Lay. I'm the repair shop manager here at Claire Gibbons Violins. I've uh, graduated from the violin making school in Salt Lake City in 1983, and I've worked here uh, since 1986. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about bridges. We usually think of a violin bridge as that thing that holds the strings at a comfortable playing height above the fingerboard and in a configuration that allows them to be bowed individually. While this is an important function, the bridge also plays a complex acoustical role in shaping the sound produced by the instrument. First, it helps to transmit the vibrations of the strings to the hollow body of the instrument. The body, in turn, by virtue of its broad surfaces, sets the air into motion, and that vibratory motion of the air is what we perceive as sound. The second way the bridge affects the tone of an instrument is that, while transmitting vibrations, the bridge actually filters them somewhat, reducing the strength of some, hopefully undesirable, frequencies, leaving others to seem more prominent. The bridge also affects other qualities that might not be perceived by a listener, but are apparent to the player. Qualities like quickness of response to bow strokes, and the ease with which one can play loudly or softly, or other dynamics. Precisely how the bridge contributes to an instrument's tone isn't completely understood, but it's generally acknowledged that a bridge's own resonant frequencies are a significant factor in how it operates. That's right. The bridge itself flexes and vibrates in several different ways at several different frequencies, regardless of the note being played. How the bridge vibrates and at what frequencies is determined by its physical properties. Properties like density, weight, stiffness, etc. And these properties are determined by two main things. The material from which it is made and its shape. For hundreds of years, bridges have been made of wood, specifically maple. Nowadays, most bridge wood still comes from Europe, specifically the region around Bosnia-Herzegovina, which lies between Italy and Greece. The best wood comes from very old trees, as old as 300 years, because the tree rings of the outer layers of older trees are very close together and tight-grained wood makes the best bridges. After harvesting, the wood is seasoned a long time before being made into blanks that will eventually be custom-fitted to an individual instrument. These blanks are already recognizable as bridges, but virtually every surface made by the manufacturer will be modified and refined to achieve its final shape. The blanks we use are made by a few companies in Europe. The general shape of a modern bridge is prescribed by tradition and experience. Centuries ago, there were many different shapes of bridges, with differently configured cutouts and even different numbers of cutouts. Experimentation over centuries has produced the basic model we use today, though different manufacturers have slight variations. Beyond that, individual violin makers can apply their own preferences and theories backed by experience, when custom fitting a bridge to a specific instrument with the intention of maximizing that instrument's musical potential. When carving a bridge, I begin by fitting the bridge blank's feet to exactly match the shape of the belly where it will stand. A good fit ensures that the vibrations of the strings are transferred efficiently to the body. I use knives to do this fitting. When carving a bridge, I begin by fitting the bridge blank's feet to exactly match the shape of the belly where it will stand. A good fit ensures that the vibrations of the strings are transferred efficiently to the body. I use knives to do this fitting. Belly shapes can vary quite a bit from one instrument to another, even between instruments from the same maker, so it's rare to find a that a bridge that's been carved to fit one instrument will fit another. It's not just the fit that's important. The angle of the bridge on the surface of the belly is also critical to its operation and longevity. In this drawing, you can see that the strings behind the bridge are at a steeper angle to the belly than they are on the fingerboard side. 
So the force they exert on the belly through the bridge, as indicated by the arrow marked A, is not quite perpendicular. Having the back of the bridge, the side facing the tailpiece, perpendicular to the belly, ensures that the downward force of the strings passes through the middle of the bridge. If the bridge deviates too much from this orientation, it will tend to lean even further and eventually bend. After the feet are fit, I'll establish the final height of the bridge. This is done with reference to the fingerboard because the strings need to end up in the correct position relative to that. The angle of the neck and fingerboard over an instrument's belly can also vary a lot from one instrument to another, and even a single instrument's neck angle can change over time as a fingerboard is worn down or the neck joint shifts under the tension of the strings. The range of possible neck and fingerboard positions on top of the different shapes of instrument bellies pretty well ensures that bridges are not interchangeable from one instrument to another. When the bridge's feet are fit and its top edge height and curve are finalized, its thickness can be established. The blanks are usually much thicker than the final bridge will be. I use broad knives to do the shaping of the faces and smooth the tool marks off with a file. On a bigger cello bridge, I use a plane to do the rough shaping. With the feet, the crown, and the front and back surfaces of the bridge done, I then carve the edges, refining the cutouts. This is also done with knives, though much thinner, narrower knives. With the shape established, I'll then add a strip of parchment to keep the thin e-string from cutting into the wood. Parchment is actually made from animal skin. It's not paper. Finally, I'll give the bridge a light coat of sealant, partly to protect it from weather changes and partly to keep rosin and black smudges from mutes from soaking in and permanently discoloring the wood. 